good afternoon, or if you're a few hours west of me, maybe near the Indian Ocean, good morning, or perhaps if you're all the way over the Pacific, good evening. Welcome to today's webinar, which was inspired by the United Nations World Oceans Day. I'm Veronica Coyle, and I'm from Data for Good, the host of this webinar. Data for Good is all about inspiring and enabling people to use data to benefit society and to benefit our planet. I'm speaking today from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. And I'd like to start by paying my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We have two awesome speakers lined up for today, and who better to speak on World Oceans Day than an oceanographer and a marine biologist, ecologist. But before we get to the speakers, let me start by just pointing out to you that towards the bottom of your screen, you might need to wiggle your mouse, you'll see a Q&A button. Now, because we're in a webinar today, and not using Teams, your cameras are off and your microphones are off, but we absolutely want to hear your questions. We'll be addressing the questions at the end, so after both speakers have spoken. So please, as you think of them, and as we're going through the talks, enter them into the Q&A box, which you should be able to see down at the bottom. And it would be great if you can help me out by indicating which speaker the question is for. So it can be you know, just for Matt or for Rob. And then when I'm asking the questions at the end, I'll make sure I address it to the right speaker. Now you'll also see near the bottom of your screen that there's a chat button. Um, I myself am speaking to you from my closest ocean is the Pacific Ocean, because I'm on the east coast of Australia, but I'd love to hear where you're from and what your nearest ocean is. We may well have some people near the Indian Ocean or perhaps the Southern Ocean, so it'd be great to share that with everyone who's at the webinar. So without further ado, let me begin by introducing our first speaker. So we have Professor Matt England, who is an oceanographer whose research explores global scale ocean circulation and the influence it has on regional climate, large scale physical oceanography, ocean modeling and climate processes. Using ocean and coupled climate models in combination with observations, he studies how ocean currents affect climate and climate variability on timescales of seasons to centuries. His work has made significant impact on the treatment of water mass physics and models, on the methodologies of assessment of ocean and climate models, on our understanding of large scale Southern hemisphere climate models, and on the mechanisms for regional climate variability over Australia. Professor England, I'm going to hand over to you and welcome. Thanks, Veronica, and, and thank you everybody for joining. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I'm actually in my office at UNSW, but I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with you all virtually. I'm gonna share some slides and um, hopefully stick to the time available to allow Rob plenty of time himself. So let's see how we go. So yeah, thanks, Veronica, really great to be here. Um, I'm gonna to talk today uh, for the next 20 minutes or so um, about the ocean's payback for global warming. And what I mean by that, um, I mean, basically the oceans are doing an incredible kind of apparently free carbon uh, mitigation process for us. They're, they're really reducing the rate of global warming, both because they uptake a lot of carbon and they uptake a huge amount of heat. I'm gonna explain why that happens and, and tell you a bit about some of the data sets we have to understand that. Um, and, and really how data science is just at the core of what we do and, and why uh, we produce a lot of data and it is, it is for good. We're, we're producing data to understand our planet. It's a precious place to, to have to live on. Um, it's the only one we know that's habitable in the known universe. Um, and certainly if we, are, are, if we are ever to find something like it, I, I think it's gonna be not at all feasible to, to, to venture that far away, despite what people like Donald Trump might tell you. So, so why do I talk about the payback for global warming? Um, what I'm, what I'm referring to here is, is basically this heat uptake by the oceans that it does, doesn't come free of charge. Um, first thing I wanna point out is if you were maybe coming from that planet I referred to, maybe they've got their problems and they're venturing towards our planet. If they were to do that, venturing towards earth, the first thing they might do is ask us why we called it earth, which really actually means soil and dirt and not ocean. It really is more of an ocean covered planet. About 30, about 75% of the earth is covered by the ocean. Come to the Pacific and you'd, you'd kind of find it hard to land on 
Earth. You'd find yourself landing in the ocean um, if you're just randomly hitting the planet. And, and this has been, um, you know, all of life on the, on the planet has come out of the oceans. It's, it's fundamental to, to who we are and what we do. We've obviously evolved out of that ocean into land creatures, but we still get a lot of our food and, and, um, and other resources from the oceans. And, and the other thing that we have on our planet, which is incredibly nice, is this natural greenhouse effect. And so um, what I mean by that is we have these greenhouse gases that occur naturally in our atmosphere. So one of the things we'd, we'd need in, on any planet that we might eventually go and, go and colonize, I don't think it's going to happen, as I said before, but you need an atmosphere and you need an atmosphere with some sort of greenhouse gas uh, chemistry because you want to have a way for that planet to be insulated and to sort of keep the warmth from the nearby star. And you want that to be stable as well, because it really sets the climate of the planet you live on. And so uh, this natural greenhouse effect's been there since forever. It, it has obviously varied with the concentra concentration of greenhouse gases over time. Um, and unfortunately, the very stable Holocene climate, so for over 5,000 years, ever since modern uh, civilization um, established itself and cities, cities were you know, we, we ceased being nomadic people and, and settled and, and created agriculture and, and, and eventually villages and towns and cities, you know, things have been very stable until we realized we could create power by digging up coal and burning it and, 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 and oil and so on. So digging up fossil fuels and producing energy was a great thing to do back in the industrial revolution. Unfortunately, we've done so at an increasing rate, at a rate that's completely unsustainable. The science is, is very clear that this trajectory we're on with our emissions goes way beyond anything we've seen in the last three or four million years and certainly takes us to climate states that no humans have ever lived through. We don't know exactly the cost this is gonna pose on society beyond that it's gonna be enormous. We're talking meters of sea level rise all of the world's coastal cities that we know and love being unviable without massive engineering projects to build seawalls multiple meters high. It's unfathomable because the costs of doing these sort of engineering projects are vast. Um, just to remind you, we've known about this problem for some time. Um, back in the 70s, the climate science community was already talking about the, the threats posed by increasing greenhouse gases. That's back when concentrations were, or emissions, I should say, were back at this 3,000 um, million tonnes per annum. It's a huge number already. Um, we had the UNFCCC, which said, let's not interfere with the climate system in dangerous ways. Every nation, bar one or two, um, signed this, this treaty, and, and yet pretty much every nation has ignored it ever since. Our emissions are up plus 45%, plus 50% since this UNFCCC um, convention was signed off on. Uh, we're up over 10,000 uh, million, 10, 10 billion tons per annum, which is um, a ridiculous number. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues in the UK, Corinne Lecure, said already a decade ago that emissions are out of control. Uh, and it, it, it's not an exaggeration to say this. So we've now created a new uh, planet. It, it's got an enhanced greenhouse effect. We're tracking up towards um, doubling our concentration of greenhouse gases. And this has a very big impact on our climate system. Already today, we're seeing temperature changes that I'll show in a minute that um, reflect this increase in our greenhouse gases. And, and I should say quickly before I get into the oceans that a lot of these details on the physics of the climate system and, and exactly how greenhouse gases work and what their chemistry does to our climate how the radiative properties um, in the atmosphere dictate what the temperature is at the surface of the earth where we live. A lot of this dates back to many, uh, many centuries. It date back, dates back, our understanding is not something that came about uh, when, uh, you know, the last decade or two, it's deeply um, grounded in physics that was well established back to Fourier, working out, um, you know, how the atmosphere contributes to planetary temperature. Tyndall measured greenhouse gases quite precisely and how, each of them, methane, carbon dioxide and so on, trap heat. And so it goes right through multiple centuries of science. And, and, and once we get to multiple centuries, whether it's gravity, um, the physics of light, physics of the climate system, you really have some well-established facts. And that is that greenhouse gases trap heat. They, they, they um, warm our planet. If we increase their concentration, they'll warm our planet further. And there's more basic physics that really um, doesn't need 
um, you know, really up to 19th century, a lot of this is known 130, 140 years ago, things like the reflective properties of the surface of the earth. So we know, for example, that snow is highly reflective, 80% of what of the light that hits snow goes back into the atmosphere. Sea ice, slightly less reflective. Um, the ocean surface, very, very uh, absorbent of, of heat and light, okay, 6%. So it, if you look from space, the ocean I had before, it looked, looked colorful and blue. It really it looks quite, quite dark, almost black in color. If you have a satellite looking at infrared radiation, it's a very absorbent surface. And that contrasts, say, the albedo of, of desert sand that's, that's about 60% reflect, oh, sorry, 40% reflective of light and only 60% sort of gets into the sand and, and warms it. And, and so uh, the other thing we know about the basic physics of our planet is the heat capacity. And what this is, is it's a measure of how much energy it takes to warm a given substance by say a degree Celsius. So to warm moist air in the atmosphere, um, a whole kilogram of it, which is quite a big volume by a degree Celsius takes you about 2000 joules. The ocean in contrast, it's about double that energy. And that's at first surprising. You think air shouldn't take that much energy, but I'm talking about per kilogram of air um, and a kilogram of moist air is way bigger than a kilogram of, of ocean, about a thousand times bigger. And so if I convert these units to the amount of energy Oops, just need to go back and show you those numbers. Um, here it is in, in a measure of um, energy per meter cubed, the, the joules of energy for the, air, the atmosphere is not unchanged. Suddenly it's about 4 million joules of energy to, to warm a meter cubed of ocean. And if you think about just those two things, the reflective nature of the oceans versus ice, which is to say they're not at all reflective, and the fact they take a lot of energy to heat up, it's no surprise that we, when, you, when we go looking for global warming and where it's actually occurring, it's pretty much all going into the ocean. So the energy that we're trapping with greenhouse gases, we, we know that to quite precise levels, that energy is all going to the oceans bar about 6%. And that's going into warming the atmosphere, the continents, melting ice and so on. And so when we look at the projections for the future, and I, I wish I had a time to show you a slide for what's happened over the last 50 years, but it looks exactly like this, but you put a decimal point before, well, actually not quite, the Arctic's about two degrees or so warmer. But this is the projection for the end of the 21st century. And you can see all of the physics I just described playing out here. Ice reflects heat. And so you can see the, the big warming over the Arctic and the Antarctic. The land reflects heat, it doesn't absorb it. And so the, the warming of the planet is skewed towards greater warming over land, much weaker warming of the oceans, um, and, and this is this buffering effect I referred to. And so the oceans are taking up huge amounts of energy. And by doing so, they're taking heat from the surface in the atmosphere where we live, and it's getting subducted into the ocean interior. Okay, so that's good news, right? We, we like the fact that the oceans are buffering climate change by taking up this heat. The bad news is that it doesn't do so without some sort of payback. And that's why I put this title on the talk. And the payback is that we, we get this vast melting of ice sheets. We have a thermal expansion of the oceans. Okay, so, so it, putting this heat into the, into the ocean, and it's not just at the surface, it really penetrates down some 50 meters uh, globally, but also it gets into thousands of meters deep um, in, in certain parts of the ocean where the overturning is very strong. And so getting this heat into the ocean sounds like it's a good thing, right? We're burying the energy that we've trapped from these greenhouse gases that we've produced. That sounds good until you realize that anything that warms expands and anything that warms can melt ice. And so the oceans are doing this, uh, this expansion, both due to thermal expansion and also they're, they're gaining volume because they're gaining the melting of ice at the polar caps. Just looking at the Antarctic as an example, there's a huge amount of heat, um, especially in the Amundsen Bellingshausen sector. And this heat is, is uh, shown here on the right hand side. This is the amount of warming we've seen over about 30 or 40 year period up to about eight years ago. We go looking for where the ice shelves are melting. No surprise, the greatest melt of these ice sheets, these big red dots are where the, the loss is the biggest. That's exactly where the oceans are warming the fastest. And in fact, you get some gain in some of the regions where Antarctica is cooling, but the net 
effect is a big uh, loss of, of mass of the ice sheets and ice shelves. This is going to lead to problems that are that are uh, beyond imagination in some sense. Um, I don't mean to 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 to, sh to mention confronting figures that, but I but I, we need to. They're, we're talking about tens to hundred million people displaced from their present um, environments around the coast. We we tend to live at the coast, right? We tend to use the oceans for as a source of food, as a, as often estuaries and so on flow there. So we've got fresh water through the rivers. When you when you build up massive amounts of infrastructure right at the coast, you then start to see massive displacement of people um, resulting from this. And we're already seeing the low-lying regions of Bangladesh, Holland and other places, the, the Maldives, uh, all, all the Pacific Islands, they're, they're terribly vulnerable to sea level rise because they're sitting at such a low level and they don't have the advantage of, of having land to go and settle in um, that, has, that has higher elevation away from sea level. So we're going to see big displacement of peoples worldwide. The other payback that's often not appreciated is that these um, uh, that, that ocean warming uh, drives out our storms and our cyclones and our weather systems. And tropical cyclones in particular are a really nasty one because uh, whilst we don't expect to see more cyclones as the climate warms, we are expecting to see them get more intense on average. This was the season of Hurricane Katrina. I might just see if I can fast forward uh, without messing things up too much. Here, you'll see Katrina form just off Florida. This devastated New Orleans. It, it acquires it, its energy from the warmth of the Gulf of Mexico. Here it is. And, and so this trajectory, it took over the oceans. Uh, it started off as a category, not even a, a cyclone. It starts off as a, a sort of low pressure system. It intensified to category um, one, two, three, four, five. And it hit New Orleans at the worst possible location because um, New Orleans is just to the right here. There was a big storm surge just to the right in these northern hemisphere systems. Um, the winds were onshore, massive swell, huge 10 metre higher sea level whilst the storm hit. And of course, on top of that, an absolute deluge of rain coming in from above. And so, you know, this, this free heating service I initially spoke, spoke about for the oceans is not free at all. It raises sea levels, it melts ice, it intensifies tropical cyclones. And um, it also, just looking at the time to make sure I'm not going too far, it also um, affects ecosystems. And Rob will talk about this a bit more. And, and that is, uh, it's not my field of expertise, but, but we know that the world's marine ecosystems have adapted to a given temperature. The rate of change of temperature in the oceans is unprecedented for these ecosystems. And so, some of them like coral reefs are gonna go beyond what they can adapt to uh, and we'll see mass bleaching worldwide. Okay, um, I do have a little bit of time just to finish up and talk about data. And I do wanna, I know there are some people tuning in from schools and I just wanna say just how fundamentally important data analysis, um, the hardware and also the, the tools to analyze data is important for us. Um, this is from the weather scale right through to climate science. So um, we have satellites flying overhead all the time, measuring uh, a whole stream of data, whether it's cloud cover, um, winds over the surface of the ocean, the temperature of the ocean. They measure the chlorophyll concentration. Um, that, that helps us understand um, the, the biology in the oceans. They, they mes measure wave height so we can see exactly where swell is. And then huge data streams also within the ocean. So we have these autonomous floats now, 3000 plus of them trekking around the ocean. Um, they, they, they evolve contracts and they become dense, they sink to great depth and then they, they measure temperatures and salinity down at, at deeper depths and they resurface sometime later. So there's huge amounts of data coming to us, um, terabytes every day and we need advanced you know, mathematics, computing systems, computational engineers, biologists, physicists, a whole heap of fields are needed to process this data and to make sense of it. It's not just, uh, you know, it's valuable to get data from satellites, but unless you know what to do with it and how to interpret it, um, you know, you're a bit lost as to what you're looking at in terms of the physical climate system and how the oceans are changing. Okay, I believe I've got about two or three minutes left. And so I'm just gonna finish off with a really beautiful animation of the oceans that's no longer from, from data streams from satellites I just showed, it's actually from a computational model. 
and you saw the scale of New York there. It's funny when you zoom out, at first you think the resolution is going to be way too coarse. How can we look at the oceans? So this resolution that I started with there is the resolution of this uh, model globally. We've worked with this team in the US and brought this model to Australia and adapted it to the Southern Ocean um, as well. And so we're really glad to have this model running. It's, it's massively expensive on Australia's top supercomputers. Super but as you can see, um, it, it simulates a rich array of physics. Um, it captures eddies over the oceans, particularly in these Western boundary currents, the Gulf Stream here. You can see this transport of heat uh, northwards in the Gulf Stream that actually provides a, a wonderful free heating service to Europe across now into the Pacific Ocean. This is into the region where we have the El Nino, La Nina oscillation. That cold tongue of water there is, is like what happens when a La Nina occurs. Uh, in contrast, when an, when an El Nino occurs, the opposite will take place. All of this warm water to the west will come flooding across to the East Pacific. And, and our weather systems will change. Australia will be uh, plunged into drought and a severe bushfire season. And so all of the knowledge we have about the oceans comes not only from these observations that we get from satellites and from shipborne measurements and from, from uh, Argo floats and so on, but it also, um, you know, we complement those vast data sets from observations uh, with these model models because it turns out to be really costly to get measurements beneath the surface of the ocean. And so these models are good at patching together those bits of the puzzle that we don't get um, from, from the times we're not at sea or from the parts of the ocean that we can't get to so easily. Um, given we're in the Southern Hemisphere and I've got about a minute to go, if I'm lucky, I'll be able to get into the Southern Hemisphere with this with a click of a mouse. And here we are, South of Africa, looking at one of the world's strongest currents, the Orgulis current, leaking a lot of warmth that gets into the Atlantic and affects the overturning circulation that, that started the, the whole animation um, of this model. Okay, um, I... Uh, have pretty much come to the end of the talk. I will finish by wrapping up if I can sneak out, or maybe the slide will keep going with the animation. Um, I just want to say, you know, these data streams are massive, they're vast, they are helping us understand that problem I started with, which is uh, the rate at which the oceans are uptaking this heat. We know it's a good thing that the, the rate of global warming is slowed down by the oceans warming. Unfortunately, uh, that good news story ends there because by warming, the oceans raise sea levels, they melt ice, which raises sea levels further, they intensify our storms and our cyclones, and, and they also damage ecosystems in profound ways. So um, I'll come back obviously during, during the q and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you, Matt, that was brilliant. Now, I just wanna take a moment to remind everyone, look for the Q&A button and please um, bring up that screen and enter your questions as we go and let me know if you've got a question for Matt or a question for Rob. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Professor Rob Harcourt lectures in marine science and is an expert in marine biology, specializing in marine conservation, marine ecosystems, animal behavior and ecology. He leads the Marine Predator Research Group and Australia's Integrated Marine Observing System Animal Tracking Facility. He studies how marine animals respond to human impacts, such as alteration of oceanographic processes due to climate change, marine habitat degradation, shipping and fisheries interactions. His research has made valuable contributions to conservation of large marine vertebrates, including sharks, seals and whales, through drafting species recovery plans for the federal government and providing expert comments to state and federal government. NGOs and the United Nations Environment Program. He's an expert witness, chairs international committees, sits on ecological risk assessment, technical panels, and has authored multiple public, public submissions. Rob, I welcome you and I hand the stage over to you. Well, thanks, Veronica. I didn't realize I was all there. Um, well, Matt's presentation was fabulous and I'm gonna follow up. Um, I'll dive straight into it. So I trust you can all see that. Um, and I did, I did want to just, a, a point popped into my head as I was listening to Matt's talk to um, also point out, because we work on shipping and shipping and its impacts on marine animals is that 90% of all goods go by sea. And of course, all of our ports are at sea level. 
So you can imagine that as um, the ocean expands, as Matt was talking about, we're going to have serious issues in terms of, of not just moving people, but moving goods. And so a lot of the things that people take for granted now are going to change. So but I'm going to bring us down to a, a slightly finer scale um, and look at actually how we collect data for to, to infill with these amazing models that Matt was that Matt was showing us. And I'm particularly going to focus on one component, which is the program that I run here in Australia. But the way we collect data for um, to, to actually allow us to have all these models is through um, a whole host of different uh, methods. Now, Matt showed you some beautiful satellite animation. Um, and he talked briefly about Argo floats, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but over the last um, two to three decades, we've had a huge increase in um, the available technology that we can use to collect data. And the reason that we need to do it is for the reason, as Matt already showed very clearly, you know, 93.4% of the global warming is occurring in the oceans. And if you look at this figure here, can you see my arrow? Monica, someone can tell me. Hopefully you can. I mean, the... Yep. If, yes, great. Thank you. <laughs> lots, lots of hands. So you can see that a, a lot, a large amount of the um, heat is going here into the upper oceans, but quite a significant amount is going into the deep oceans. And so in order to get really good information about what's happening, we can't just rely on satellites. We need to go, we need to literally dive deeper into, into the data. And the reason for this, of course, is, um, in fact, um, I know we this is advertised as World Oceans Day, but uh, literally, um, figuratively speaking, it's really World Ocean Day because there is only one ocean. We have ocean basins that are all connected. So all of the oceans of the world are um, strongly connected through circulation of different currents. And um, if you look at here, this is what we call the thermohaline conveyor belt, which is essentially um, as the as the ocean is dynamic and as the earth is spinning on its axis, you know, the, the waters are moving around and as they're heating and cooling through the different seasons and through the melting and freezing of the ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic, um, there's a huge amount of physical pressures pushing those, pushing water masses around and identifying where those water masses are going. And you saw beautifully illustrated in Matt's um, animation, the, the Gulf Stream moving up through the um, eastern side of the of the North Atlantic, but of course all that water goes up, keeps Europe nice and warm, and then it comes comes down in, down into the South Atlantic. So you can see that here. This is the uh, a very just a static illustration of what Matt was showing. You can see, of course, the waters rise as they warm and they sink as they cool, and so that's why you end up with what we call this global circulation. But you can see, so right through the Indian Ocean, right through the Pacific, North and South Pacific, we have this strong connection. And the only place that the waters can go all the way around is down here in the Southern Ocean. And that's important to remember. So how do we actually collect the data that we use to, um, to um, take these observations that allow us to make sure that our models are actually providing good information about what's going on? Well, traditionally, and way back from the beginning of oceanography, um, measurements were taken by using what we call a conductivity temperature depth. Um, rosette, so lower down from the side of a ship on a crane, so ships can go move around and they can lower down um, in a, very, a range of different instruments, whether it's temp, uh, in primarily temperature and the salinity, which is measured through conductivity of the, of the water is, is, is the, are the crucial ones, but we measure a whole host of different things now, oxygen sensors, looking at dissolved oxygen, looking at the amount of chlorophyll, so an indication of productivity. Um, and traditionally, we, ships were done, but of course, there's, ships are expensive. They cost $140,000, $150,000 a day, and they can only do so many measurements in a single day. Um, the Argo float array, which you can see illustrated here and which Matt briefly uh, mentioned, um, really transformed our understanding of what's happening in the ocean. And these are like small autonomous sensors that um, they're on a float, it's a couple of meters high, you know, a couple of people can put it off the side of a boat. And what happens is it um, has a little oil bladder connected to a, a timer. And um, so the oil is heated and that makes it rise and the oil is cooled and it sinks. And um, it slowly descends down to about 2000 meters, um, very slowly. So it's collecting data as it goes, drifts around for about nine days with the ocean currents. And then 
um, the bladder warms up and it comes back up to the surface and you get what we call a temperature conductivity profile for that float. And that's what's giving us an indication of the um, temperature and the conductivity for both the upper and for the um, lower reaches of the ocean. And there are, in fact, deep Argo is, 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 is just started up too, so I'm gonna go even deeper soon. Um, and as I said, we've had huge advances in ocean observing over the last 20 years. So this is, um, this figure just shows us the Argo status 20 years ago in 2001, when there were about 262 floats deployed by a number of countries. Um, and if we look at what's happened over the last 20 years, there's been a fantastic increase in the amount of information available. This is not just Argo floats, these include ship-based measurements as well. But you can see we've got much better coverage of, of the ocean. But there are still some really important gaps. And if you look at the north of Australia, you can see there's virtually nothing occurring around here. And if you look up in the high Arctic and down in the Southern Ocean, you can see there are major gaps as well. So, um, and given that, as I mentioned, the Southern Ocean is the only place where the water goes all the way around, we really need to get very good measurements under there. So the question arises, but why don't we just go down and do them? Well, if we look at the sea surface, so this is um, a photo I took of from some shark surveys just off Seal Rocks, north of, uh, north of Sydney, which is where we're based. Um, if you think of the ocean, that's what you think of. You think it's a nice, clear, open surface. And, and that's how we transmit, um, how we can collect a lot of this data. You can drive a ship over that fairly easily, probably stop and photograph the dolphins as you go. Um, but if we look at the ocean surface down in the Antarctic or in, or in the Arctic for large amounts of the year, though, if you, if you've been following, you'll know that in the Arctic, the amount of coverage of, of, of by ice in summer is actually shrinking dramatically and very fast because of all this heat going into the ocean. Anyway, there's a problem. You've got no open surface. So as I mentioned, ships go and they will lower a CTD down, um, obviously where there's open water and the Argo floats come up to the surface and transmit their data after they've had their nine days floating around and it's transmitted to the satellite. But if there's ice there, they can't really do it. So um, it's a significantly more difficult to get data um, from areas that are covered with ice. This is one of our campsites down in um, the Ross Sea, down um, not far from um, Mount Erebus. In fact, that is Mount Erebus here. Um, and so Argo floats have been designed to try and collect data from under the ice. And so, if you look at this illustration up the top here, you can see that as the Argo floats come up, if they, um, if they sense ice at the top of their antenna, then they sink down and wait, and then they come up again and they keep trying until they can come up. And so you can collect data under the ice with Argo floats, but it's difficult. You know, they, they're likely to get crushed. It's an incredibly hostile environment. And because they can't transmit their location, you can lose, um, locate you can you know get much less accurate accuracy in where their profiles are so how do we overcome this important data gap um, from areas which are covered in a larger amount of ice for a significant part of the year so if you went down to the southern ocean now the ice for, for a significant proportion of the southern ocean is over a meter thick and Fortunately, some year, about two decades ago, a couple of people came up with the realization that in fact, while we might have a lot of difficulty going down to the ice, a lot of other animals live there. A lot of other ocean users um, are quite at home in the sea. This is a little wet or seal puppy that I videoed when we were doing some work a few years ago, about six years ago as part of our program. And so this animal is about three to four weeks of age and you can see it's sitting in water which is about minus 1.8 degrees c and it's fairly comfortable with its environment the other thing you can see and it's taking a breath now is that um, these animals live in the ocean um, and here they live under the ice but they have to come to the surface to breathe sometimes they also want to know your camera and What these animals do is that they live under the sea ice and then they keep these holes open in the ice year round. So this animal is having a little bit of a look at me and it's going back to where he feels comfortable under the ice. And um, if we look at the environment as a whole, this is in fact where they live. So 
here's a, a couple of Weddell seals here. Um, and this is essentially where they spend all of their time. Now, the good thing about these um, ice um, loving animals is that they dive really deeply. So Weddell seals like these, these um, rather cute guys here, they'll dive down 900 meters um, while they're looking for food. And um, if we look at some of the other animals that work with the elephant seals, they dive as deep as 2000 meters. So that puts us down into the region where we can get the deep um, ocean warming measurements. And the thing is that they will find places to come out. So if you're an Argo float, you're rather stupid. You surf, you float up. I mean, you're not particularly stupid, but you're, um, you've got a limited amount of, of ability to negotiate a rather difficult um, environment. But these guys have, have evolved to live down here. This is me walking around the ice, I've got a scratch here. And um, as a consequence, we've worked with the seals to, I'm going to move on from there, I think that's enough, to have a new partnership, a partnership between um, the animals that we're interested in because we're interested in them anyway, but also because of their ability to um, venture into areas which we simply cannot. Um, and so they can they make sort of ideal research partners. So what I'm going to show you now is this is our, um, our program with um, SEALs principally, and I'll move on from there in a little bit, um, and show you some of the work that we're doing with these guys to collect the data that we need. And you can see, so here, this is a, a Weddell Seal haul out just near Scott Base down in the Ross Sea. The green buildings behind are on land. We're actually working on the sea. And you can see here's an animal equipped with a satellite tag that we've put on it um, that measures conductivity and, um, and temperature as the animals are diving. You can, so we put the tag on this animal probably a week ago. They're reasonably chilled out. These guys are just fast asleep. We're, I'm sitting out to the spider with an iPhone. I'm like two meters away from this animal. They're, totally chilled as we've, uh, after we've been working with them. So I'm gonna show you how we attach these instruments to the animals. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, what we've found from um, this program. So this is, a re uh, think of it as a recruitment agency. I'm coming in to recruit a new partner to our program. And I'm working with a colleague of mine from University of Tasmania. There we go, we've walked in, we just quickly gave the, an animal a mild anesthetic. And uh, then we sit and wait for it to go to sleep and then we can work with it. Um, things don't always go quite that smoothly. So that's a, 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 a perfect uh, recruitment here. So slightly less cooperative uh, recruit. One of the things about seals is they don't have long legs, but they do have, they are very, very large and powerful animals. These animals weigh about three to 400 kilos. And of course we're working on ice, it's very slippery. So they can send us, send us plummeting. Okay, so once we've, once we've caught the animals, we, um, we weigh them because we're biologists and we're interested in the animals welfare and also their animals ecology. We're trying to find out what they're feeding upon under the sea ice and make sure that there's no, no um, impact upon them from um, fisheries and things in the Southern Ocean. So we weigh them and um, we also collect a range of different measurements such as blood and, um, come on, sorry, the video is freezing. and a range of other things that allow us to work out their ecology. Here we go, it's freed up. Um, we're also examining their teeth, look, look to see how worn down they are. And uh, we, you can, we have a vet here at the front who's ensuring that every, um, that the animal is absolutely fine. Measure them, take a whole host of different things. Occasionally we can collect a poo if we're really lucky. Sometimes they poo on us. All right, and then we just wait around while the seal recovers to make sure it's all okay. And then they've been equipped with these small computers. 
but um, will last about a year and give us data over the course of the winter. Now this, what happens is the, uh, the animals then go to sea and as they dive, when they go down to the bottom, um, the micro computer on their head will collect a series of temperature and salinity measurements as they come up to the surface. It'll give us a profile of about 20, um, set of, with, with about 20 measurements from the bottom to the surface. Um, that data is transmitted by satellite. So the animals come through the sea ice and they take a breath and the tag sends off a, um, a compressed um, algorithm of the, of the data. And we end up with huge amounts of data. Um, and you remember earlier on, I said that ships cost about $140,000 a day upwards. Um, so these animals will be diving every day to feed. And so we'll get multiple measurements from each of the animals as they, as they um, move around across the, the, uh, the oceans. So if you have a look here, this is the, the Australian contribution to this. It's an international program. Um, and you can see here, so we've got sea lions up off Southern Australia. We've got elephant seals coming off here, um, Macquarie Island um, and Campbell Island. And um, in a moment, you're gonna see some fur seals off. Uh, I'll hear some Weddell seals and elephant seals down here in Pritz Bay, which is one of the Australian bases. Um, more coastal measurements from sea lions more measurements from elephant seals and weddell seals and some fur seal measurements off Eastern Australia, which is a, a global hot, hot spot of warming as well. So through collaborating with these seals, we're learning an awful lot about their environment and also about potential impacts upon them and um, getting enormous coverage in, their, in, in a period where you can't really get any other means of collecting the data. In fact, if we look at, um, so this, figure here is a little bit complicated. Uh, basically, this is latitude, so that's the equator down the middle. And then this is going south and, and north. And you can see that, uh, so this is south, um, something like 70% of all of the profiles collected south of 60 degrees have come from um, seals, because that's the area where it's very difficult to get other, other um, observing instruments in. And so that's improved our models, the sort of models that Matt was talking about, by about 15%. It's a significantly important contribution to these, um, to these data, um, large databases. We've also found some really very, literally very cool findings about, um, particularly around about the Southern Ocean. So Antarctic bottom water is, is that really cold, dense water that sort of sits, uh, um, it sits at the bottom under, around the Southern Ocean and um, is the source of a lot of the different variability in, in terms of the, um, the, that thermal haline circulation uh, belt that I talked about. And seals have, um, acting as profilers, have identified um, novel um, shelf water in the Cape Darnley Polinia, Polinia areas where the ice doesn't freeze year round. Um, it's also, they've also helped us identify um, different sources of um, suppression of, of Antarctic bottom water from melting ice shelves. So because they dive in close to the edge of the ice shelves, they, they're actually collecting data that allows us to measure exactly how things are changing very close in and so it's altered some of our models of what's happening close to the southern um, southern ocean so we're getting uh, changes in uh, oceanographic data from these animals but also we're finding out and this is the most important thing for me as a biologist we're finding out a lot about the animals themselves as well so this is a weather seal female she's just given birth to this pup you can at the moment you can see she's a big fat um literally a, a full of blubber she probably weighs about 430 kilos and her pup probably weighs about 30 to 40 kilos at this point. The pup was born maybe a, um, an hour before I took this photo. The temperature is about minus 40 degrees and um, this is early October. And if you look at the same pair about five weeks later, you can see that the female now weighs about 350 kilos and the pup is bordering on 100 kilos. Um, it's just starting to mull here. You can see it's getting towards the end of lactation. So this is this, this massive transfer of food across to the pup. Now, this is really important because it means that the females at the end of lactation, when they're um, rarely feeding, 
uh, transferring a huge amount of, uh, of their um, energy across to their pups. And of course, that means that they're going to have to go off and replenish that energy the following year, so which is right, what happens right across the winter when we've got these tags on them. And in fact, if we look at um, the change in buoyancy of the females as they gain weight, and this is particularly good for elephant seals, um, we can actually determine where they're finding the food that they need to um, retain, uh, re return to their large fat self when they're going to give birth to the next pup. And the reason for this is that when they're diving at sea, and they have to sleep at sea. They live at sea essentially, except for the period when they're pulled out either to molt or to, to um, give birth to and suckle their puppies. And so if we look here, you can see the blue areas are a negative change in drift rate and the red is a positive change in drift rate. The drift rate refers to essentially how fast they drift when they fall asleep and they sort of float down a little bit like a leaf falling off a tree. Um, and, and when they're skinny, it's the same as if you blow out when you're in a swimming pool, you'll sink really fast. But if you take a big breath of air, you're going to float or go down much more slowly, depending on how fat you are. And the, the, how fat you are is a deliberate comment because as the animals get fatter, they get more and more positively buoyant. So their drift rate declines. And so you can see the blue areas are areas where their change in drift rate is negative. So they're getting, they're not, not finding, oh, sorry. They're not finding food, um, but the uh, red to orange areas are where they're actually putting on so much weight that they're sinking slower and slower in the sea. And so that allows us to determine foraging hotspots in situ, um, important areas where the animals are. And then you can overlay that with things like um, fisheries models like CAMLA. Okay, and so um, by working with these seals, we've managed to collect a huge amount of data um, that's providing very important information for what we're doing to our planet. And at the same time, it's finding, providing us a really important information about these incredibly beautiful animals that we want to protect. And as a result, we're getting a lot more data for both um, important for protecting our ecosystems and for um, at least allowing us to have insight into what damage we're doing so we can, we can move to try and, um, and mitigate that. You know, if we can persuade the politicians to do so. Um, now, I talk primarily about conductivity and temperature, but we have now trialed fluorescent tanks, which allows us to measure chlorophyll production, so me actual measures of productivity, and uh, dissolved oxygen as well, which is really important for looking at where, um, where animals are going to feed, um, and also to look at the, um, the levels of oxygen that are actually dissolved in our oceans. So, in conclusion, not for the whole talk, but for this first part, seals clearly rule. And as I said before, they're significantly cheaper than ships, which means we can continue to do this program relatively cost effectively. They will work for sardines and other, other yummy fish. So then the question comes back to you, obviously seals are pretty amazing, but who's next? Well, everybody wants to be involved in the program. I mean, why wouldn't you, it's, you, know, you get to do good science? Um, this is an emperor penguin sort of worrying why the seals get all the attention. Emperor penguins are actually also a very important component of the Southern Ocean. They also stay down there year round. And as you can see from this guy, he's coming over to say hello. They are amenable to working with. They're about 40 kilos, so they're quite large. They can carry a large instrument. And they're really actually extraordinary animals. These, they dive 600 meters, go down 13 feet, go, sorry, uh, dive for 13 minutes. They're not the only ones that are really providing us with really good information because we don't just have gaps in the Southern Ocean. So this is some work from a colleague of mine in Hawaii where they've been using, where they've been attaching oceanographic instruments to tiger sharks. And you can see on the right, the broken step looking at temperature and depth. And here's some tracks from around Hawaii where Kim, um, Kim Holland is his name, he's been um, doing this work for, for many years now. And so there again, important information about the biology of tiger sharks, but also really good information on things like the mixed layer depth. Um, so the area you know, where, where we get the declines between top layer and, and lower layers of the ocean. And we are, um, there's some really good work in Northern Australia. You remember I said at the top of Australia, there's a quite a large gap looking at um, the use of turtles with similar instruments to the ones we trial on the seals. 
olive ridley turtles dive and dive down to the bottom and then they come up later and you can see here this track of pardon me of these olive ridley's tagged by um, clive mcmahon who works in in um in this program um from a few years ago um looking at um these tracks from these olive ridley turtles and multiple profiles collected in the area which is very um poorly serviced and one of the reasons for that is the argo floats need to need um to sink down to about a thousand meters and the sea is too shallow so measurements in shallow areas are relatively sparse that's why we had the sea lion program in the coastal uh, for coastal oceanography as well and then speaking of shallow waters being um, poorly serviced one of the real problems with a lot of our instrument measurements from things like satellites is that very close to shore there's um a paucity of good data because of the dynamic nation of, co of of waves and oceans and the stirring up of the waters and so there's you need to do really good cal calibration of what's being actually measured by satellites and so um recruitment has gone not just from animals but even across to some of us who are really keen on this stuff and um the this is uh this is uh some tracks from some of my surfing and that's obviously my new surfboard and um there's some uh big community program looking at using surfers to help also provide us with good high quality data from the coastal zone. So um, whether it's um, very large and extremely home in the ocean animals or some clumsy guys on fiberglass, we're managing to get really very, very high quality and large amounts of data from a lot of the areas which have been uh, until now relatively poorly served. And I think that's where I finish. Thank you everyone for listening. That's awesome, Matt. Thank you. That was really informative. I, I, sorry. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> I've enjoyed both presentations and thank you both. Now we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, we've got quite a few questions. So hopefully we can keep some of the answers reasonably short. Um, first few questions that came in, of course, were for Matt. Um, so first question, at Matt, is what is the normal temperature for ocean sea surface temperatures before global warming, climate change, etc.? Yeah, good question. So it ranges from about 30 degrees Celsius in the West Pacific warm pool. That's the warmest global temperatures we get uh, in the open ocean. And that it, it cools to minus two because so seawater actually doesn't freeze until minus two degrees Celsius. So that's the range, 30 down to minus two. And globally, it's increased by about a degree Celsius. Some places like the East Australia current by two degrees. So about a degree sea warming globally. Wow. Also, we have a question, Matt, you mentioned you're using a lot of tools. Can you share what some of those are? Yeah, so there's a whole lot of data analysis tools. So putting together those terabytes of data into, into more succinct summaries. So we, you know, we process that data to analyze variability, to analyze long-term change. And there's a whole lot of advanced stats methods. I won't go into those. Um, so, so it's those analysis tools with stats methods, but also um, these computational models, which take the laws of physics, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, momentum, and so on. And, and we configure these models. You could see the little Lego pieces in that last um, animation that starts in New York. And those models complement our data analysis of the observations to advance our physical understanding of the system. All right, and this question first came up for you, Matt, but I think actually it probably applies to both Matt and Rob which was, are there any existing data, so, uh, data sets that you know, those of us with data skills could help use to contribute to solving problems? Yeah, I should answer really quickly and then give it to Rob. Everything we produce is, is open access, open source, uh, the data streams from satellites, from Argo floats, it's all, I mean, I, again, somebody could email me, but if you Google them, you can find most of them, but yeah, it's all open, open source because we need that data to be available to all scientists worldwide. Yeah, and to, to um, back up what Matt just said, so all of the data that I was talking about, apart from the surfing data, um, comes through the Australia's Integrated Marine Observing System program. And all of the data for that, because it's publicly funded data, is publicly available. And you can find it on the um, aodn.org.au site. And feel free to just go for it. That's why we, that's why we collect it. And um, it's high quality, quality controlled data and it's, and it's available almost in real time for a lot of it. Awesome. And we can probably share some of those links with our um, follow-up newsletter. Um, so another 
question that's come in. It says, hi, Matthew, great presentation. Have you done any research to identify the slowdown of air travel and fossil fuel production during COVID lockdowns and what the impact has been on the rate of heat uptake in the oceans? Yeah, that's no, a good question. I haven't done that myself, but there was a group in the UK who put together, you know, how the emissions just dipped down a little bit. And we saw when Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, there's a little dip in our emissions, but the trajectory is really like this. And you see tiny little dips there. And the COVID, the COVID lockdown will be a tiny dip as well um, on the big picture, unless we unless we use it to relaunch how we produce energy and how we travel and so on. So unfortunately, it's a very small blip on that trajectory I showed. Um, we don't need to lock down to solve this problem. We need to be out there um, building solar pan panel stations, innovating with battery technology. We, you know, changing the way we work is a good thing. Zoom, this meeting is fossil fuel free perhaps, but it's a, so we can do things smarter, but we also need to innovate and drive a new economy that's, that's low in carbon. Yeah. Now for Rob, um, she says, this is all very fascinating, but for someone who doesn't come from a background in environmental science, how can we use data analytics skills to help with the climate change issue? Oh, well, there's, um, it depends at what level you want to work really. I mean, we, and as Matt already mentioned, we actually do have um, people collecting data using citizen science, as I mentioned in that last slide. Um, but otherwise you're going to need to be, you're going to need training. And um, I mean, it, the, the quantitative work is not simple. You have to do maths, be good at maths, and you have to, um, all of my students, and one of them I know is on the, she's from Uruguay, is on the chat, is she'll tell you, you have to be proficient at coding and, and stats as well. So you, know, you really need to go and do some high degree training to be able to uh, make the most of this. Yeah, no, we're just about on one o'clock and um, I should check with Rob and Matt. Are you okay to stay on for a minute or two longer? Yep, no, no problem. problem. All right, because we've got a couple more questions to go and I apologize to any of the people who've dialed in if you have to leave early, but remember we do send the recording out. So it's brilliant that we can continue and answer a few more of these questions. Um, so next one is, hi, Robert. What are your thoughts of the melting ice of ice in the Northwest Passage above Canada and the potential increase in shipping in this region. It seems as though not much is being done as governments haven't been able to recognize the importance of the melting beyond a huge increase in economic growth. So has your research touched base on this? That's a really, really good question. So we've actually published a paper on this um, last year with one of my ex-students, Vanessa Corrado, but we were interested in looking at the impact of the opening up of new areas for shipping on the biota. So we're really interested in how it's going to impact whales and uh, other marine um, predators from the, from the Arctic and also on the Inuit communities who will be heavily impacted because a lot of their, the areas where they traditionally fish um, or where they have not traditionally fished are opening up. And so there's, it's actually a massive impact. Um, and the, there's already shipping going through that area in summer now. Um, and that's going to grow. Especially. I mean, in fact, there was an economic analysis of it done by oil and gas, and they think it's fantastic because it cuts off something like 60% of the cost of shipping across the, the Northern Hemisphere for, uh, and through the Northwest Passage from having to go around. It's a huge reduction in their costs. So for shipping, it's a big boon, but for the environment, it's a, a likely disaster, actually. Yeah. All right, we also have for Rob, um, it says great way to present some very important data. Which external parties do you communicate this information with? And are you able to communicate with governments to help change policies? Surely seeing this data makes it clear how important it is to tackle climate change. Well, <laughs> I, I think you're right. Um, this is actually government funded. So the, the program that we run is funded by um, the federal government um, with support from a lot of state agencies and universities, and it's a part of an international program. So there's a lot of government buying, um, but government science priorities and government policy priorities are not necessarily 100% um, linked. So the government is fully aware of this data. And in fact, there are government agencies that are asking for more of this data because it also feeds into climate models for um, the 
Bureau of Meteorology. So, you know, the information that those seals collect goes straight into the databases that are used for weather forecasting and for operational oceanography. So for things like shipping, um, which includes, um, you know, both um, commercial shipping and also, of course, the Navy and Defence and all of those. Um, so there is a direct link up into, into government and it's used for operational purposes. There are really strong um, levers that are used for policy as well. Um, and it helps with our formulation of policy, but that I'm a scientist and the policy makers we communicate with, but they make the policy. Awesome, thank you. One from Matt and Rob, have you had times when you've struggled with creating effective visualizations for sets of data in your research? And what are your thoughts on the level of communication you're able to achieve with the public policy makers regarding the outcomes of your research? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, every diagram we make for every paper we ever write, we look at it closely and think, are we communicating this data, this analysis as clearly as possible? You know, are the axes right? Is the zoom in right? Are the colors right? And we do that because it is, you know, visuals are so important with this. Um, and so, and that goes right through to the IPCC reports. These are massive efforts by the scientific community to put all that data and all that uh, information together in, in the most a digestible format for policymakers. So we, I wouldn't say we struggle with it, we, but we spend ages thinking about it. Um, and, and we don't always necessarily do it perfectly well. I've seen some figures where the whole caption needs a page beside it to describe what's been put together. And to me, that suggests that we haven't quite done the job right, but um, yeah, it's a big part of what we do. Yeah, and no, I just back that up. I mean, um, we're learning a lot more about how to, present our work visually than we, I mean, apart from anything else, we have the processing power to now be able to do things that we couldn't do before. And if you look at, I mean, I'm old enough and ugly enough to remember when all of the science was presented on plastic overhead transparencies, and we've moved a long way forward from that. But um, we still, we're still, um, I think, at the beginning of that journey. Okay, just a couple more questions. I've got two for Matt, I'll do them one at a time. Um, so the first question is, Matt, is there any good news? Are governments and corporations starting to take notice or do you think the response will remain mainly reactive and thereby too late? No, there's definitely good news. I, I, I did tell you all the bad news. I'm the scientist who looks at where we're all headed without action often more than with action. But, you know, clearly the US government results, the, the election of Biden last year was good. World's biggest economy is going to go there um, and people will follow I think coal is not viable anymore. It's been shown that we need to move away from that. It's, it's propped up by massive subsidies. The government decision to, Australian government decision to, to back gas recently is disastrous. It's bad policy. It's actually, you know, those subsidies should be going to getting the, the, the this, um, solar and battery going in this country. We're so well placed here to deal with it with abundance of that energy. We should be exporting it, not, not, not limiting its growth. So there, there's lots of good news and the business sector is all over this. There's a lot of money to be made basically by solving this problem and there's a lot of jobs to be created so um, my hope is that once the wheels fall off the fossil fuel sector which they are at the moment um, that it'll be a bunch of stranded assets that nobody goes near banks are looking at them as risky investments so i think that the writing's on the wall we just need it to to, to probably happen a lot so, you know quicker than, than it is yeah and the second part of the question from that person was the energy used by data centers and supercomputers is rising dramatically. So is this something you monitor or take into account as part of your work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on global scale, it's, it's a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean. If everybody says that, then we get nowhere. Uh, NCI, the National Computing Facility in Australia that sits at ANU is, is gonna be carbon neutral. I don't know the details of how they're doing that, but the ANU just announced recently that they're, that they're moving to a carbon neutral um, energy source for the NCI. So, um, yeah, it, it is important and climate scientists are always talking about, you know, especially post COVID, do we need this meeting? Let's just meet electronically. We're finding ways to do things with less carbon involved um, and supercomputing is part of that for sure. But the big, the big, big consumers are, are transport and energy globally. Um, and, and this terrible situation we have over summer in Australia where the, the grid collapses because people are cranking their air conditioning up because they're dealing with catastrophic bushfire season caused by climate change. And, and so the energy needs are only going to go up as we see. So my biggest worry is that as we need to adapt, we're going to need even more energy. And if that energy is not 
produced by solar and geothermal and wind and so on, then we're going to have disastrous you know, growth in that emissions trajectory that I showed. Yeah. So for Robert, what interesting work, Robert, over the years of study, have any changes in behavior been observed as a result of environmental changes or with the interaction of anthropogenic activities? Uh, changes in animal behavior. Oh my God. So. We haven't got very much time. There are, I mean, the, the, the I guess the, the, one of the biggest things, and I didn't talk about this, but is that there are the most, most marine animals who are at least those with coastal distributions are changing where they're living. So um, a slightly a, a good example is that we, we um, are also tracking a lot of sharks here in the east coast of Australia. And we've just analysed the data for um, a, large, a large number of the predatory sharks, so white sharks, tiger sharks, bull sharks. And they're, um, they've already changed their distribution over the course of the period for which we've got data. Bull sharks spend more time further south off the east coast of Australia than they used to. And we've um, got pretty good models that suggest that within 10 years, they'll be spending about an extra two to three months down here off Sydney than they did previously. Um, we've also you know, seen similar changes in white shark behavior and, and, and about 23 species of fish that used to only be found around continental Australia are now found in Tasmanian waters because the waters of southeastern Australia are warming so fast. Um, there's whole trophic cascades, so changes in whole marine ecosystems as um, things like kelp forests um, are unable to maintain um, where they were previously because the waters have, have warmed and um, that causes changes in um, the, the, whole, the whole inshore coastal habitat. And so kelp forests have disappeared for the most part from large areas of Tasmania. There's a few, few um, whole, you know, um, sort of havens left, but they're uh, under in, enormous pressure. So then essentially we're getting entire um, rolling changes in ecosystems as you move further and further south. The things the animals are moving further south and they're not able to stay um sustain themselves as far north as ever and of course it's varies by the plasticity so the how um adaptable different species are so some species are very resilient and they will be fine and others are just not coping and they're disappearing wonderful all right i have one final question because we we really do have to wrap wrap up but um obviously there's a great deal of interest because the majority of participants have stayed on so final questions for Robert. The seals that are helping humans to collect data, should they be a certain type of seals? So fur seals, crab eater seals, leopard seals, or just seals in general? So can any seals be chosen um, through selections that you have shown for weight, et cetera? No, that's a great question. So actually uh, there's two things. One is uh, what interesting biology are we trying to find out with the animals? And so that's a large part of their selection. But in fact, if you're looking for an animal that is going to be a good oceanographer, then you need an animal that is amenable to capture, that is not going to be greatly distressed by the work that you're doing with it. Um, and that's going to go to the places that you need to measure. So um, when people first started tagging elephant seals 30 years ago, when I was a PhD student, they were assumed to dive to a couple of hundred meters and they didn't really know where they went. They put out a bunch of devices on they all came back flattened because the animals had been diving down over a thousand meters and the pressures had just caused everything to implode and um, so elephant seals are fantastic they swim thousands of kilometers around the southern ocean so they cover large areas they dive very deep and they have different parts of their population some stay on the continental shelves others go out into the open ocean and dive very, very deep. And so we've got different behaviors from different animals. And so really you need to pick the animal that you wanna work with on the basis of the A, what is what does the animal do and, and can we work with it without causing any problems? I mean, we had thought about whales as oceanographic platforms, but actually whales are really hard to work with because you can't glue something to them and you have to do something else if you wanna attach it to them. And you can't just like a, a Weddell seal, as you saw, will haul out right next to you, put a bag on its head. You can you can work it, you can put the tag on the animal and release it within 20 minutes, and the animal then goes about its business as if you've never been there. 
but you can't do that with some of them. So you have to be quite selective about what you work with. All right. Well, I thank you both so much for joining us today. It's been absolutely brilliant to get insights into the work that you're doing. And it's wonderful to hear it directly from you rather than filtered through the press or headlines or with some sort of government um, spin put on it. So it's been really brilliant to understand the work that you're doing um, and, and to be able to put questions to you directly on that work. So again, I thank you both so much for joining us today. And I thank all of our participants for joining from around the world. Um, it's been a great webinar and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks Veronica. Thanks Matt. Fantastic. Thanks Rob. Thanks Veronica. Bye.